equality, a word so dangerous it's amazing we even still talk about it, but it's something that I think you can't avoid if you are looking at life through an Enlightenment lens. So we'll start, I suppose, with something written by Bernard Williams, who's actually becoming one of my favourite philosophers to read on just any subject at this point. I love the careful way that he lays out his cases, and hopefully I'll do him justice when I'm talking about it in this video. But he discusses his views on equality in a work called The Idea of Equality. And he begins by describing how people generally use the term equality as both a statement of fact and a statement of intent. They use equality as a statement of fact uh, to reference the concept of men as humans, equal in the fact that they are human, and the statement of intent is usually a method of proposing that because all men are human, they should be treated as equals. In trying to rescue the concept of equality, he has to stress that there are some things that we obviously have to rule out. I mean, to say all men are equal in those characteristics, in respect of which it makes sense to say that men are equal or unequal, is a, in his words, patent falsehood. In ways that men can be unequal, such as ability or status, whatever, they're obviously not equal, and identifying the inequalities, the differences, is necessary to establish the problem that we wish to solve. To say all men are equal is just too vague. In what regards are they equal? And so if it gets boiled down to in the regards that it makes sense that they can be considered equal or unequal, then that is an obvious falsehood, because in the ways that men can be unequal, such as ability, status, etc., men are most obviously not equal. And identifying the inequalities, which are the differences between them, is necessary to even establish that they are or are not equal. So the defender of the all men are equal argument must weaken their position to all men are equal as men, but as William points out, quote, what looks like a paradox turns into a platitude. He then addresses what he calls the practical maxim of equality. He believed that it cannot be the aim of the maxim to have all men treated the same in all circumstances or as alike as possible. Um, the maxim must extend to the term, the term circumstances to encompass not just a man's material situation, but also the nature of the man of, of what the man himself is, which means that for each way in which men are treated differently, there must be a reason given for the difference in treatment between one another. So essentially, equal treatment cannot equal equality due to the innate differences between men, and unequal treatment cannot equal equality due to the requirement to identify and act upon the inequalities between men. So what he is essentially laid out is that the idea of equality has got two extremes that essentially destroy the idea of equality, but it's very difficult to not just slide to those extremes. And so he wishes to save the idea of equality from what he calls the extremes of absurdity and triviality. He believed that the answers are all there within the terms as they are being used, but they're bundled together in a manner that makes their use unclear and hard to defend. He will differentiate between the description and the declaration of equality. The point of the factual assertion is apparently to back up social ideals and policies of action towards that goal. As a note, Williams believes that treating people differently just because they are poor or black cannot accord with anyone's idea of equality. So he's not attempting to justify any kind of racism before someone claims that he is. So... In the first section, which is common humanity, he elaborates on what he means by the platitudinal nature of the statement, all men are equal as men, and seeks to demonstrate it is not as trivial as it seems. Uh, all men are alike in their capacity to feel pain from both physical and emotional causes, the capacity or at least potential to feel affection for others and to feel a sense of loss. Williams believes it is not trivial because it negates the social claims of specific groups against the social power of ruling groups, and the ruling group will not make the claim of non-humanity of the other, but will instead overlook their claims by distinguishing them from wider society by some further characteristic. For example, it could have been by being black during segregation. While still recognising the innate nature that a black person is still a human, so recognising the innate humanity of the person. This is based on the assumption that there is a relevant consideration to the moral question of whether a man should be treated differently because of, in this example, his race. 
to lay claim to a certain consideration is as relevant or irrelevant, however, is to already commit oneself to a certain kind of moral principle and worldview. Williams asserts that the fact a man is black has no particular bearing on how he should be treated as a man, and would require a, particularly, a particular ideological framework to justify, as otherwise, the black man is still a man and does not differ in this respect to people of other races. Is, as Williams observes, it is arbitrary. Nobody holds the principle that black men should be treated differently to others based on the fact that they are black, but usually the rationale is to correlate black skin with certain patterns of behaviour. But this argument, as Williams points out, is back to front. Certain patterns of behaviour might correlate to black skin, but this is not the cause of the behaviour itself. Williams observes that racists concede that black people are human, but deliberately overlook or disregard their human capacity for feeling by denying their moral claim for whatever reasons suit them most. Asserting the fact that they are just as human as other men, as in just as able to feel in the same way as the person making the judgments, is to turn the platitude of all men are equal as men actually into a formidable weapon against their arguments, so it is a useful thing to be able to say. It is hard to argue that black people do not have a desire for self-respect, as Williams puts it, a wish to realise one's purpose of one's own and to not be the instrument of another's will unless one has willingly accepted the role, which I would probably just summarise as self-determination, I think you can't argue that black people don't want self-determination. And so, essentially, Williams has created a very, very useful safety net for the term all men are equal as men. In the second section, which is called Moral Capacities, Williams addresses the ways in which the proponents of equality have addressed this question so far, and how this has been negative, and that men are also equal in positive ways, such as their capacity for virtue or achievement of the highest kind of moral worth. Presumably any man as, as being as capable of the highest moral virtue as any other. Williams believes that the difficulty with this idea is for us to identify any purely moral capacities. What we consider to be virtuous is usually based on a series of physical human capabilities, such as higher intelligence allows one to better understand and empathise with the condition of another, and a man's capacity for intelligence is also used for means that have nothing to do with morality, or could even be used for evil. If we accept then that this is if if we accept this then we are also accepting that the highest moral achievement is also in part determined by natural ability unequally distributed among men Williams finds it an outrageous absurdity that the highest moral worth should be based on natural capacities since these are not purely moral capacities and come with them and, and along with the highest capacity for virtue, for virtue then along comes the highest capacity for vice. Williams invokes Kant's Kingdom of Ends from his Metaphysic of Morals, in which each man is treated as an end in himself and as a rational moral actor who chooses to follow universal laws derived from categorical, categorical imperatives by judging themselves and their own actions. Williams observes that um, Kant, in Kant's view... He goes to the extremity of the notion that moral worth cannot depend on contingencies and that each man is a rational moral actor and so each man is owed an equal degree of respect for this ability to make such moral choices but not necessarily admiration which comes from his decisions in making virtuous choices. Such choices are not evenly made due to the inequality of men both of their material context and their nat natural capacities. I didn't think to put this note in when I was writing this script, but essentially this it occurs to me this is all very sort of highbrow and like using lots of terms that people aren't aware aware, aware of, um, because I, I wasn't thinking I'd put this into a video script, to be honest. Um, so essentially what is being said here is that Immanuel Kant imagined that each individual moral, moral person, each rational human person, would have a particular kind of scheme that they would look at the world with and his way of suggesting what we can find are to be a, an objective form of morality would be to universalize any maxims by which we live our life so if we should do something if it's it would be okay for us to do a thing 
The question is, would it be okay for everyone to do that thing? So if we wanted to cheat on our taxes, for example, or would it be okay if everyone cheated on their taxes? No, the, 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 the state would collapse. And unless you're an anarchist, you don't want that. So it's it's morally wrong. Is is it okay to steal if you're hungry? Well, I don't know. Should everyone steal if they're hungry? Is you know it becomes a more difficult question. And this this makes them legislators in the kingdom of ends, in moral agents who are morally analytical of the world and make pronouncements about what should be based on the universalization of maxims. And these people essentially would form sort of Plato's um, uh, philosopher kings. Um, the, these would be the people who'd work out what right and wrong is. Uh, and Kant specifically says he's doing it from a non-theological position. Uh, he wants to do it from a position of reason. Um, and this is, this is essentially a kind of secular way of trying to look into the mind of God. I think I don't think that's overstating what Kant's trying to achieve here. Although I look forward to people who are much more knowledgeable about Kant, uh, Kant put, putting in the comments, correcting me if I'm wrong. But that's that's really what it seems to be a, a, a sort of decentralized, individualistic, and secular way of uh, using reason to effectively figure out what the perfect system of morality is. And this is something, and and Kant gives us tools to do this. Um, this this is something that obviously there are many contradictions to and many people have done a great volume of work on but I'm, i think i've accurately represented it there but do do let me know if you think that i haven't i realize it's an incredibly complex subject and i'm not an expert but i'm working very hard but anyway so williams considers that the consistency of kant's view which is to detach it completely from practical concerns and make everything a priori which means before the fact, before anything has happened. the This is purchasing things at too high a price. To separate moral worth from physical contingencies, and so if we say something is contingent, that means it is reliant on something else, and in this case it would be the, the, the material world, which is in, as, uh, in opposition to what Kant's view is, which is not connected, um, which is, in Kant's view done by turning man's characteristic, which is a unique characteristic, as a moral or rational agent, into a transcendental characteristic. And that's what we mean when we say that it is not material. This would mean that man's capacity to be a rational agent with free will that makes free choices is not dependent on his empirical characteristics, as in those characteristics in which men are demonstrably unequal, like our physical height, our intelligence, etc., etc., this means that then that the, this would mean that we are all equal as rational moral agents, because this is not connected in any way to the unequal unequal state of our bodies. So the respect owed to each man as a subject of and legislator in the kingdom of ends is not then dependent on his innate empirical capacities but instead is only accorded to him because of his transcendental characteristic of being a rational moral agent with free will. This leaves the question of how Kant believed that the transcendental characteristics were connected to human beings. If our capacity for free will and morality is not based on empirical characteristics, how can we know that the transcendental characteristics we ascribe are actually there? Kant uses, attempts to use the term ethical intuitionism, and the concept of essentially seeing the thing for oneself, which sort of returns us to the problem that Descartes had of not knowing which consciousness was connected to which body, because to separate, in Descartes' view, the, 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 the soul, the, the mind from the, the material, the body, means, well, how do you know we're talking about that mind? How do we talk about one mind? How do we talk about one body with one mind? And what's the way that we establish the connection? Kant's found himself in essentially the same position, as I understand Williams describing it. Williams notes that the transcendental Kantian conception of a moral agent and any of the concepts connected to it must have an empirical basis. The moral agents must be judged on empirical and not transcendental grounds. We cannot hold a man responsible for his decisions if there is no way to connect his moral agency to his actions. To hold a man responsible for his actions is to say that his physical person is the source of the moral agency in some way. 
Once we reconnect a person's moral agency with their empirical characteristics, we abolish the idea of moral equality, as we have returned to accepting that people's empirical characteristics, which is the source of their moral agency, are not all equal. Williams was concerned that we also ended up categorizing a man as the titles he holds, as opposed to the human experience of a man living his life who is in progress. Williams uses the example as a f of a failed inventor, and says we must write him off as opposed to recognizing the humanity of his desire to be a successful inventor. We are treating his invention, or lack thereof, as the ends, and the man himself as the means, instead of treating the man himself as the ends, as to, to, be, to be a legislator in Kant's Kingdom of Ends, well, the Kingdom of Ends is the, ends, the, the men being treated as ends in of themselves. And Williams has made a remarkably good point, a really good point, actually, which is, if we're only judging him by the success of his inventions, well, then he's not the end, is it? The, the invention is the end. Uh, he argues that the term respect is ill-defined and fails to consider further injunctions connected to it. Kant fails to consider it in William's view. If the exploited or degraded man does not see his own exploitation, we can consider ourselves to be respecting his con uh, can we consider ourselves to be respecting his consciousness of his own activities? If the exploited or degraded man does not see his own exploitation or degradation, can we consider ourselves to be respecting his consciousness of his own activities? Williams finds it inconclusive. Williams then goes on to the moral basis of equality. He found the idea of men as equals in moral agency to be lacking, and then through the question of respect to the issue of regarding men as their own person in their views and purposes, and not through their titles, as Kant's maxim of treating men as ends in and of themselves delegitimizes titles as a method of evaluating worth. Kant, look, in, Kant encourages us to look behind the title to observe that the title itself is the conspicuous bearer of inequality. And that's, I mean, that is exactly the point of a title, is to create an inequality of respect between men. One person to be elevated above others by by ownership of the title, but the title is usually given to be uh, for for a reason. What Williams believes that this means is that each man is owed the effort of understanding of how he has become what he is, and to evaluate him fairly, we must abstract him from the structures of inequality in which we find him. This is based on the presupposition that men are self conscious and self aware, and as Williams already considered and as williams already considered when dealing with respect men are not always conscious of the exploitative state in which we find them williams then addresses the question of hierarchy and egalitarianism he believes that one could accept the ideal of equality and have a society with a justified hierarchy as long as the hierarchy maintained itself without compulsion and with what he says quote is human understanding between classes of people. Now, it's a slightly less well-defined term, but he says, if the majority were to accept the human view of the world, then titles would be something which men would be content with or proud to have earned. Williams believes that the ideal of equality could exist with people considering one another as equals in theory, even if they're not for practical reasons. William's major objection to all of this is that a person's role in society is usually brought about through necessity, whether ordained by God or some other similar kind of reasoning, and these unaccountable social hierarchies would be undermined by people's consciousness of their own role. To be a part of a compulsory hierarchy requires ignorance, and once awareness is reached, the man is no longer, quote, immersed in the system and the growth of his consciousness of his position in the system would lead him to becoming contemptuous of his betters, since, quote, his awareness that their acceptance of what they supposed to be necessity is a delusion. The hierarchical idealist must accept that the things which can only be done without self-consciousness in such a system must be done hypocritically when consciousness is reached. In section three, he talks uh, called une in equality in unequal circumstances. 
He then goes on to discuss Aristotle's idea of distributive justice, where the question of equality revolves around equality of outcome and not equal treatment, uh, using distribution of goods with regards to men's recognised inequalities. Williams makes the rough distinction between inequality of needs and inequality of merit. Uh, those that might have a need for a good may not have access to said good, while those that merit something might not have a need for it. Those that need healthcare do not always have the money to afford it, and those who merit a university education do not always desire it. Though the financial circumstances of the rich and poor are dramatically different, those essential needs are still the same. Distribution by merit has a competitive aspect, whereas distribution by need does not. So Williams believes that we must necessarily speak of the distribution of the opportunity to achieve the good. He finds himself here to be a bit of a muddle, as he believes that he is treating illness and owing money, or owning money, as if they are equivalents. To escape this predicament, he distinguishes between having the right and securing the right. For example, all men might have equality before the law, but if one cannot afford a lawyer, then one cannot secure that right. He considers this like he considered the statement all men are equal as men to be a powerful moral weapon against racism. He considers this to be a genuine moral weapon that can be used when dealing with any kind of unequal treatment, even when not dealing with the concept of equality more broadly. He considers it to be a strengthening of the weak principle that men are equal in the status of being men and in the rights that they share. So he's 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 once again managed to bolster the the weakness of the argument, of the statement, of the, which again does seem to become like a platitude: all men are equal, or all men are equal as men. Williams then goes on to address merit and the question of equality of opportunity. He argues that equality of opportunity is really equality of outcome, and uses the hypothetical example of a warrior society where admission to the upper echelons of society is occupied by a warrior class that is recruited from the richest families. Egalitarian reformers ensure that the rules are changed so that warriors can be recruited from every section of society, provided they meet the qualifications, but the results are essentially still the same, as only the richest families can produce candidates strong enough to qualify. The undernourished poor are no longer being held back because they're poor, they're held back because they're weak, but their weakness is a consequence of their poverty. The same happens with wealth and intelligence, and so the argument naturally flows to the question of reallocation of wealth because there is only one way to provide equality of opportunity, and that way is to provide equality of material conditions. There is no other logical end to this line of thought either, and we can use it to justify almost any level of interference in people's lives. And so we arrive at a point where our, where our individual identity is thrown into question. If we are insistent on equality and have the means to control the development of a person, then absolute equality and equality of opportunity harmonize into the same concept and one person will no longer be distinguishable from another. By now we have reduced a person to nothing more than the sum of their abilities, which we are somehow at liberty to manipulate at will with, without regards to the person themselves. Emphasis is placed on high achievement and nothing else, such as community integration or happiness. Are we at this point treating man as an end in himself, if we only focus on the things external to himself, such as his effect on the world. Williams ends his piece theorising that equality of respect is also something to be considered, but overall lacks any definitive answer to the questions he has raised. So I think it's worth going over in some detail some of the deep concepts that Williams has brought up here, just to hammer a few points home. So it might sound like I'm repeating myself, but I, I'm trying to expand on it a little bit, because there's an awful lot here, as I'm sure you've realised. Um, when Williams states that people use equality as a statement of fact and a statement of principle, he means that people are using equality to mean either or both the factual assertion that men are equal as men, that they all have the same needs, drives, and bodily functions. When used as a statement of principle, equality is meant to mean a normative statement of an ideal, how things should be. These must necessarily not be synonymous, of course, because if people were factually equal, there would be no need to concern ourselves with the ideal of equality, as it would have been already been achieved. 
An interesting counter-argument to the argument that all men are equal as men is that, say, if we're distinguishing between fact and value, the aristocrat could say that he does not see why the fact of a common humanity between the aristocrat and the peasant should force us to draw a value judgment. If the aristocrat denies the moral claim from the fact of our common humanity, well, what does the peasant have to say about it? And Williams would probably answer saying that they are overlooking or disregarding the moral claims of their social inferiors um, that the uh, that the aristocrat themselves makes from their innate humanity. As in, the aristocrat would argue that because he feels pain, etc., he should be treated with a certain level of consideration, and indeed, because of his other traits, he should be entitled to special privileges. Why should this not also follow for the object of the aristocrat's prejudice, as in, the peasant? The aristocrat acknowledges the humanity of his perceived lessers and can only deny their moral claims through special pleading. It's okay when I do it. The aristocrat already has a moral commitment in his treatment of other human beings as inferiors, and so the aristocrat cannot deny the moral counterclaim which arises from the inferiors, as the, the argument would collapse under the slightest amount of scrutiny. Basically, if he can say, it's okay when I do it, why can't they say, it's okay when when we do it. Williams acknowledges the empir empirical inequalities of men and addresses the argument that there are ways in which men are equal that are not based on their physical being, such as their moral ability and capacity for virtue. He begins this by addressing the difficulty in the person's capacity for moral, the, the difficulty in assessing a person's capacity for moral action by observing that he cannot identify any purely moral capacities of a human being. So while some innate characteristics create a variable effect on a person's capacity to be virtuous, such as intelligence, these characteristics cannot be said to be used for only moral reasons. And this leads Williams to what he calls a powerful strain of thought that suggests that moral capacity is based on our innate physical qualities. These qualities not only vary from man to man, but can be used for vice as well as virtue, which therefore cannot find men to be equal to one another as each person is just physically different. As I said earlier, Williams then uses Kant's thought experiment The Kingdom of Ends, in which each man is an end in and of himself and should be given respect as a rational moral agent, and distinguishes this from the admiration they earn from their natural abilities and the use and extent to which they are exercised. Williams believes this to be the high price that's being purchased at. To give the man universal moral worth is to detach his moral worth from any, any, any empirical contingencies and transform the man's characteristic as a rational moral agent into transcendental characteristic, not depend on any empirical capacity he might have. And the, important, the, the reason that's important is because essentially what we're saying is Kant would ha think there was moral worth to ISIS, jihadis, who are chopping off heads in the Middle East. Uh, the, 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 the empirical capacity and the the things that a man has done i think really do have to matter when it comes to judging his moral worth uh, personally um, but this means in kant's view the capacity to be a rational agent cannot depend on his empirical characteristics which is a secularization of the christian concept of respect owed to all men as the children of god Williams' issue with this pertaining to the question of equality is that moral agents must be judged on the empirical grounds, not transcendental ones, and if we are forced to judge people on empirical qualities and they cannot be judged as equals, since they do not share all of the same empirical qualities in equal abundance. If we are to hold a man responsible for his actions, Williams believes that uh, how we treat him as a moral agent which is how we treat him as a moral agent, then we must have an empirical basis because his actions are empirical, but also unequal, which is why we distinguish between him and other people for the purpose of moral judgments in the first place. Returning to Williams talking about the unequal distribution of goods in society, the equality, inequality of need, inequality of merit, uh, he says that inequality of merit des describes the distribution of merit-based goods, which he believes were inherently competitive due to the usually limited supply of such goods, combined with their widespread desirability and attainability. The ability to earn the good is not sufficient to guarantee the receipt of the good, uh, which is often contingent on other factors such as wealth. Inequality of merit describes this and, in William's opinion, strengthens the principle that in the differences in differences in the way people are treated, reasons should be given. Um, the relevance to William's argument th th that this has is that Williams is not trying to play revolutionary. He is trying to set out a method of thinking about the problem that is applicable to the real world so that the ex of the system can be mitigated from within the system. Strengthening arguments for equality in this context is the purpose of his paper, and these distinctions draw out the unfairness of a system that could, with only minor alterations, resolve them. 
inequality, uh, equality of opportunity must also include consideration towards the a priori exclusions of certain segments of the population. For example, an elite school for which access is on the grounds of ability is considered equality of opportunity necessarily, but it necessarily excludes those with inferior ability because we think of it as appropriate or rational, as someone who has allocated school position based on wealth would have said, and therefore could equally claim to be supporting equality of opportunity, which would be absurd. And Williams finishes his essay by discussing how equality of opportunity conflicts with equality of respect. Equality of opportunity reduces individuals to their characteristics and focuses on their abilities and achievements over their happiness, which conflicts with the equality of respect that is assigned to people as people. So the whole notion of equality is very, very complex and contradictory. As a quick summary for me, I actually found Bernard Williams' attempt at rescuing the concept of equality from itself uh, quite heroic in some ways, and I like the fact that he's not playing revolutionary. He's in fact trying to prevent the revolutionaries from winning the argument. And he is persuasive in what he argues, I feel. It's just whether this is going to be well advanced by other people and whether the concept of equality can be rescued from the radicals. But um, Robert Nozick wrote a reply to Bernard Williams in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, and I really think it's worth going over, because essentially Nozick demolishes the concept of equality. Um, the, The part that I'm going to be talking about is his attempt to show that equality of outcome is essentially impossible without preventing any capitalist act and deeply interfering of the, with the patterns of behaviour of that people engage in on a daily basis. So he begins with the, cons- the concept of equality. Is equality a necessary component of justice? Nozick believes that Williams never actually argued that it is, but assumes it and builds his argument from there. Nozick complains that there is a surprising dearth of arguments in favour of equality to show that, in his opinion, that the concept of equality must be built into any theory of justice. He addresses William's thoughts on the distribution of medical care, which Williams finds the proper allocation of medical care should be found uh, should be based on need and not a person's ability to pay. Nozick describes this as Williams arguing that saying something has a proper form of distribution is to give it an internal goal, a higher purpose, as if Williams is looking at the medical practice as if it is one of Plato's perfect forms which is opposed to how Nozick views it. He views it as being an expression of an individual's activities. Williams' own view conflicts with his concern regarding equality of respect afforded to people as people. A doctor is not a servant of the medical form, the profession, and is not obliged to perform service in service of such an ideal. He is a person worthy of respect beyond his profession. Nozick identifies this by addressing Williams with the question, why must the internal goal of the activity take precedence over, for example, the the person's particular purpose in performing the activity? This centres the view of the conversation on the individual taking the action, rather than the condition of the composite sum of actions that have been taken that that we would describe as healthcare. So the, the doctor comes first, rather than the abstract goal of the system. Nozick juxtaposes the example of the doctor with the example of a barber who cuts his client's hair for the pleasure of the conversation he has with them as he works. If the only proper distribution of his skills is those to who most need them, is it unjust for the barber to allocate his work only to those with which he enjoys talking? Nozick considers this to be the only way of actually treating the worker as the end in and of themselves. So, if the doctor is not to decide how he allocates his labour... Who is? Nozick reasons that if the doctor himself is not responsible, then it must be society itself that is responsible for somehow arranging things that the doctor's desire for purpose and society's own needs are met. After he goes through the layers of William's argument, he arrives at the claim that society should make provision for the important needs of all its members. Nozick observes correctly that this presupposition is not argued for, but just assumed to be true. Williams is taking a very much top-down view of society that does not look beyond the allocation of goods to where the goods to be allocated originate and the entitlements of the people who possess the goods. 
Music's meaning behind the term entitlements is simply something someone is entitled to do. For example, a man is entitled to spend his own money, exert his own labour, dispose of his own property, but he is not entitled to do with someone else's money, labour or property. Then Nozick comes to section 2, which is how liberty upsets patterns. And in the section, he demonstrates that if people are entitled to spend their money as they see fit, they will inevitably end up creating inequality. He uses the example of Wilt Chamberlain, a famous basketball player, in a hypothetical scenario where the public choose to donate 25 cents of their ticket price to him personally because they enjoy his performance. Even in a scenario where the resources are evenly distributed, the end result is an uneven distribution of resources, where Wilt Chamberlain ends up with a massive amount more resources than everyone else. Nozick questions whether this distribution of resources is unjust, since each person was entitled to spend their resources in this way, and if not as they, as they choose, and the consequence is that equality ends where liberty begins. If this inequality is, for some reason, still considered unjust, then a mandate is created for the continuous interference in a person's patterns of behaviour to ensure that equality is maintained. Any independent act of trade between consenting parties would need to be prevented, requiring draconian control over people's lives, as a system that requires continuous equality is inherently unstable because of the free actions of the people within it. As Nozick puts it, the socialist society would have to forbid capitalist acts between consenting adults. So it's important to know that Nozick is not actually taking on any of Williams' arguments directly. He is actually taking on the underlying presupposition that Williams doesn't address. He's, Williams is attempting to save the concept of equality from its extremes, and the arguments he makes are all from the presupposition that equality is a plausible or desirable goal. Nozick attacks that presupposition itself, peeling away the layers, uh, to address the fact that he's arguing in support of equality without actually arguing for equality. So I realise this has been an exceptionally complex video, and I'm talking about two great philosophers who are arguing over concepts that effectively we're never going to see any change to in, I think, mainstream dialogue. The, the concept of equality is too deeply baked into Enlightenment philosophy, I would say. And it's something that I, I do find insufferable and infuriating to talk about. Constantly, constantly arguing for equality, but never specifying what that means or what we should expect the desired outcome to look like. And uh, I think Nozick has raised some really insurmountable problems for the concept of any kind of material equality. Um, people are different. Any act of liberty creates inequality. There is a mandate created for unbelievable tyranny by pursuing equality uberalis and i think that that's i mean equality it, it, i think we can consider it to be an important moral principle but i don't think it's the only important moral principle or just the moral principle and i think that we have to make sure that when talking to any other any, anyone in this regard i think that really equality should be sidelined for other ideas such as fairness or in just deserts, this kind of, you know, what does someone actually deserve, rather than, are they all the same? 